Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Battensby. I'm Head of Research Business Development for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon for this uh, Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult Horizon Europe Showcase. Uh, hopefully this afternoon we're going to run through a series of presentations in terms of the UK's current position uh, in Horizon Europe and, and how we plan to engage in various uh, European research funding calls give you a bit of an overview of what ORE Catapult's uh, working on in terms of European engagement and how we'd like to engage with European researchers and companies, and then some examples of some quite highly innovative UK companies and what they're doing at the moment in terms of product development and how they could work with European partners. So for the first presentation, I'm going to hand over to Alain Fairclough, who's the national contact point for Horizon 2020 on energy. So over to you, Helen. Thanks very much, James, and thank you, um, everyone, for joining. Um, as James says, um, what we're trying to do today is to showcase some of the UK capability. Um, we're conscious that in the light of the UK's association to Horizon Europe, uh, that there may be some questions around uh, UK eligibility and also um, about the UK's areas of strength in relation to Horizon Europe. So we're really keen to showcase some of that uh, content to you today and allow you the opportunity to ask questions and to hear, as James said, from some of the organisations that are highly innovative in the areas that are relevant to Horizon Europe. So I'll be covering the introduction to Horizon Europe. I will just cover this to make sure everyone is on the same page with regard to understanding what Horizon Europe is. I'll explain UK eligibility for the programme and then I'll hand over to, um, to others to talk about the capabilities and experience and we'll come back for Q&A and uh, talk about next steps. So just to introduce myself, I'm a member of the UK National Contact Point team for energy uh, called EU Energy Focus, and this is funded in the UK by the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. Our role is to provide to support UK organisations on European energy programmes, as of which Horizon Europe is by far the largest. And we're part of a UK National Contact Point network. So once you get the slides, um, you'll be able to click on this link to find the other National Contact Points if you're in the UK. So there's a National Contact Point for all of the areas of Horizon Europe. And there's also an international contact point network. So if you're not from the UK and you're not already in contact with that person in your, your country, then you'll be able to use this link to find out who that is. The services around Europe and beyond are very similar. We're here to promote the programme to answer your questions on um, eligibility, uh, both in terms of the number of organisations that need to be involved and also the relevance to particular core topics. So just to make sure we're all familiar with the key aspects of Horizon Europe, I've listed some of them here. It's a research innovation and market uptake funding programme. It's the European Commission's R&I funding programme is the way it's described. And Horizon Europe will run from uh, this year until 2027. So it's a seven year programme and the priorities for, um, for many areas of the programme are defined in work programmes. So it's not up to individual researchers to come forward with their ideas in, um, of what they would like to be funded. The Commission defines the priorities in work programmes and it's it's for that reason, really, that we're able to showcase capability that we think is relevant to the particular core topics that the Commission has published in 2021 and 2022. Collaboration is a requirement in the majority of cases, so I've included a link there to eligibility, which is in the Horizon Europe online manual. But at a basic level, the criteria is that you need to be involved in a consortium involving a minimum of three different legal entities from different member states or associated countries. So that means you, would ha you have to collaborate to put forward a proposal for Horizon Europe in the areas we're talking about today. And that's why we're keen to showcase capability and to build networks with others around Europe to build strong teams that are well equipped to address the call for proposals. Proposals and projects must have a European impact the programme is about advancing the state of the art at a European level and really contributing to the achievement of um, policies and strategies across Europe. So in particular for energy, 
the um, target is to help the Commission to address and to achieve the green and digital transition. Um, and so you, you really need to think about how what you're proposing to do contributes to that impact when you're preparing your proposal. Proposals must be innovative at a European level. Horizon Europe can't pay for projects to catch some parts of Europe up to the, the state of the art at a European level. So you do need to be highly innovative in working with the key players in Europe to be um, in, to be uh, to have a chance of success. It's a cost sharing program, so you can't make a profit from the projects themselves. But the Commission would be keen for you to go ahead and commercialize and exploit any technology that's developed. You can make a profit from that, but the project itself is a cost and risk sharing approach where the Commission will make a contribution to your costs. In some cases, for us, for example, for the low technology readiness level activity, that can be up to 100% funding. So this slide shows the structure for Horizon Europe, and I've highly, highlighted the areas in green that we're covering today. So um, the, the capabilities and experience that we're showcasing are relevant to cluster four, which is digital industry and space, and cluster five, climate, energy and mobility which both form part of Pillar 2, the Global Challenges and European Industrial Competitiveness part of the programme. Also shown on this slide are the budgets. These are budgets that don't yet take account of the contribution from associated countries, including the UK. So the budgets will increase. And he, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the Commission defines the priorities in Pillar 2. In other parts of the programme, for example, in Pillar 1, Researchers can come forward with, their, with a more bottom-up approach to research and put forward their ideas. Uh, but in Pillar 2, the Commission is defining the priorities and you are asked to address, address those in order to be eligible for, to um, submit a proposal. So let's have a look at Cluster 4, just at a very high level. I'm not going to explain the core topics or anything like that today. The Commission is having information days over the, this week and next week to do exactly that. So there's a couple of days of information days on cluster four and a couple of days of information for days for cluster five. So all of the information about exactly what the commission is looking for from these, these projects will be presented by the commission officials in the coming days. But just the high levels to make you aware of where things fit. The cluster four is divided into what are called six destinations. So you can see here the destinations three, four and six relate to digital and the areas that are covered by that. So, and the, the capability we're showcasing today is relevant to some of these areas. Also on this slide, we've in, in, indicated the call opening dead time, um, date and the first deadline in 2021. The work programme is a two year work programme, so if, you, if that's not enough time for you, there will be topics that have uh, deadlines in 2022, um, but it, the, the deadline does vary according to the core topic. It's not up to you to decide whether you apply in 2021 or 2022. It's dictated by the core topic. Also on this slide, we've got the contact details for the national contact points in these areas. Industry is covered in destinations one and two and then space in destination five. You can see that there's crossover with the energy parts of the program here with advanced materials for energy storage, including hydrogen electrification that could be relevant to some of the people on the, on the webinar today. So please do consider both cluster four and cluster five um, when you're thinking about uh, ideas for um, proposals for Horizon Europe. Looking at cluster five, so this is now brings together climate, energy and mobility into a single cluster. And here we have destinations one and two covering climate and cross-cutting activity. So batteries, for example, which is considered to be a cross-cutting element because it addresses um, the climate transition as well as energy uh, related aspects and mobility is here in this uh, cross-cutting area. Then we have energy, which includes renewables, energy systems and grids, CCUS, cross-cutting, and then buildings and industrial decarbonisation, and then mobility. So here you've got a mixture of um, land, uh, air and water transport across a range of different um, areas in destinations five and six. 
We've also included the budget and the links to find more information from the national contact points. So I'll just look, briefly look at energy in a slightly more detail, just to a number, I know a number of you on the webinar will be interested in this area, and to highlight the renewable energy technologies as, aspects and the energy systems and grids within destination three. Considerable amounts of the budget will be going towards these areas, and I'll just highlight that in the next slide shortly. But main thing on this link is to, on this slide is to, um, that you'll have the link to the work program. This was published on the 16th of June. Uh, there were working documents available before this. So if you've already downloaded a working document, please do now go to access the final version of the work program, which is the official document and includes in the final wording of the core topic. So make sure you're working with the most up-to-date information. So that information is included on this slide. And here you can see the deadlines for 2021 calls for proposals and the amounts of money that are going to these areas and the number of topics that are covered. So you can see that for the um, for renewables, there are two different deadlines depending on which areas you're addressing. The first, the 5th of January and the second, the 23rd of February, with the majority of the money going for that uh, 23rd of February deadline. There's also energy systems and grids topics with the majority of the um, funding going for this January deadline. So whilst, whilst this might seem like a long time away, we know that organisations are already developing consortia in these areas and that people have been working for a while based on the working documents to put together proposals. So if these are of interest to you, please don't hesitate to contact um, myself if you're based in the UK or your national contact point in your country. So before I, we go on to look at the relevant um, skills and capability that we're showcasing today, I wanted to just make it clear what the UK's position is. So we've the UK has announced that we will associate to Horizon Europe. It's only when we're not actually able to do that yet because the programme itself, the overall programme, hasn't been ratified at a European level. But all of the negotiation to do that and for the UK to associate has taken place. So once that ratification has happened, it will be possible for the UK to associate. And the European Commission has published a question and answer document on the UK's participation. So the UK will be an associated country to Horizon Europe, which means that UK scientists, researchers and businesses can access the funding on equivalent terms to organisations in the EU member states. This means that UK organisations can coordinate proposals and projects that they count towards that eligibility requirement, which, as I said, in, in uh, many cases, is a minimum of three independent legal entities established in different member states or associated countries. So a UK organisation would count towards that. The UK organisations will receive the same funding rates as organisations from member states, and they'll receive that money directly from the European Commission. Associated status is a, st is a standard um, status within Horizon 2020, the previous programme, and in, into Horizon Europe. So it won't be something that's new to people that you may collaborate with. And hopefully that means it will be a straightforward process for UK organisations to participate. There has been some uncertainty caused by over the last couple of years following the referendum decision, which has meant that UK participation in the programme has dropped. But the UK's uh, success rate has actually remained the same. So UK organisations who have continued to participate have, um, have not, not had any barriers to their participation. The success rate has remained the same. The only reason why the funding rate has dropped off was because a few, fewer UK organisations have participated. Um, and that might be because of concern um, regarding the risks of doing that. But now, it, once the UK is associated, which um, will go ahead as soon as, as soon as that's possible to ratify, to do that once the programme is ratified, then um, we're really keen, um, as, as a representative of those UK organisations, we're really keen to participate in Horizon Europe and to be a strong um, consortium, uh, either leader or member. So please do consider UK organisations in your uh, when you're forming your consortia. So I'll stop sharing now and I'll come back to my slides once uh, we've heard from the organisations showcasing themselves today. 
That's great, Helen. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for such a comprehensive overview. And it's good to know the uh, UK is fully um, committed and bought into uh, the Next Horizon uh, Framework Programme. So uh, I'd just like to introduce now my colleague, uh, Dr. Tom Wildsmith from our applied research team, who's going to give a, an overview of the offshore renewable energy catapults activities in a particular thematic area. So Tom, over to you. Thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of, of, of the offshore renewable energy catapult and some of the, the work that we carry out. So I think, first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce the offshore renewable energy catapult to those that haven't met us before. So um, we uh, we see ourselves as the UK's leading technology, innovation and research centre for offshore renewable energy. And our main focus is on how do we accelerate and create growth for UK companies in the offshore renewable energy sector. <clears throat> and we've got a, a series of ways we do that, uh, ranging from how we can grow the offshore renewable energy sectors as a whole, and that's offshore wind, wave and tidal, how we can utilise the unique facilities, um, both in terms of uh, hard facilities and the um, the knowledge in our research and engineering teams um, and how we can bring innovators, industry and academia together. Um, so very quickly, um, RE Catapult is part of the Catapult Network. Uh, these, this is nine technology innovation centres um, spread across a series of themes spread throughout the United Kingdom, uh, ranging from digital and satellite applications through to cell and gene therapy um, and medicines. Uh, we work very closely with a range of these, um, helping to try and transfer technologies in, into the offshore renewable air and energy area. Um, we're an independent not-for-profit organization um, and we're very much uh, here to try and be an enabler um, and accelerate technology development. Uh, in terms of um, the offshore renewable energy catapult itself, we're now over 200 engineering and research and sector experts um, with some world-leaning test and demonstration facilities based in our facility in Blythe. Uh, we have eight sites throughout the UK, um, as far north as Aberdeen and as far south as um, Hale in Cornwall. Um, and we cover, uh, we have three academic research hubs. So we work closely with the universities of Manchester and Strathclyde on electrical infrastructures, uh, the University of Bristol on blades and composites materials, uh, and the University of Sheffield on powertrains. It's also worth noting we have an international research and innovation center in Yantai in China as well, which uh, helps us work much uh, very closely with some of the organizations out there and support UK businesses in the Asian markets. In terms of what we do, um, I think this is a, a, a good a good starting point. We really try and sit between TRL level three and TRL seven uh, and looking at how we can accelerate concepts which are coming out of academic research we're moving past experimental proof of concept all the way through to prototypes being demonstrated in operational environment and we do that using the range of facilities and knowledge that we have within within the team um, in terms of what we look at um, there's a snapshot of some of the areas we're working on there uh, ranging from very futuristic um, uh, longer term offshore wind generation applications through to energy storage solutions um, and how we could utilize hydrogen and we really do try and work with 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 all ends of the spectrum so we work very closely with both academic research groups and with industry partners so i wanted to go through um, some key themes that we work within the catapult as a, a snapshot into some of the research that we do uh, and give you a flavour of, of the backgrounds we have and where we might be able to support Horizon Europe and other collaborative bids. So the first one I want to discuss today is floating offshore wind. So um, floating offshore wind is, is definitely uh, a, a growing area. Um, we're looking at really now how we can how we can make floating offshore wind cost competitive. So how can we drive down the cost of floating offshore wind so it's compatible, comparable, sorry, with fixed based as a uh, some of our analysis on, on the bottom right there. Um, it's also a key part of us delivering net zero. Um, if we're really going to get to 100 gigawatts of offshore energy by 2050, um, a lot of this was going to have to be floating offshore wind. And that's just because of the, the, sea, the seabed depths, particularly in Scotland, the Northeast and the Celtic Sea. And I think the, the, the final point to highlight here is it's a global opportunity. So there's emerging markets in Japan, um, Norway, Greece, Portugal, the US, uh, and Taiwan. And there's also some really key areas for innovation around this. So things like the dynamic cables, which uh, support the power takeoff from the turbine, 
um, the foundations themselves, not just in the design, but how do we manufacture them? Um, moorings and anchoring systems, um, how, you know, not just adopting oil and gas technologies, but how do we narrow the footprint? How do we get a higher density of turbines in a single space? And also the installation and deployment of turbines, you know, how are we going to get them uh, in situ and, and set up, given that the deeper waters tend to be further offshore? Deeper waters mean it's going to be harder to use jack-up vessels and, and, and things like that. And so we, we've got a, a range of research areas focusing on this area. I think it's also worth mentioning we've got our floating offshore wind centre of excellence. So this is a joint industry project. Um, I think we're up to about 13 partners now, um, a lot of uh, offshore wind uh, developers um, and operators. It's a collaborative programme, so we've got both industry and academic and supply chain partnerships throughout. Uh, so you'll see the Supergen logo in the bottom. And there's a, the, 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 there's a large portfolio of work going on, be it technology development, uh, supply chain, uh, looking at how we can work on consenting and, and, and the overall net zero picture. Um, so, you know, the idea here is that we, we cover a range of areas which enable and accelerate the uptake of floating offshore wind. And, and if you follow the link at the bottom there, that will take you to um, a, a list of the projects which are current, currently up and running and, and planned for the future and give you an idea of some of the things that we'll be looking at moving forward. One of the other key topics that uh, we work a lot on is grid integration um, and how we get power from wind farms into the grid. So as you can expect, offshore renewables will become more competitive with other sources of electricity. Uh, so we're looking at intermittent uh, and variable sources of energy displacing power plants. Um, there's also going to be a challenge there about how we balance the power flows onto electrical networks. If you combine this with an increased demand in terms of uh, more electrical vehicles, electrical heating systems, et cetera, then you know, it becomes more and more challenging. So a lot of our research and testing is focused on, I'd say, four key areas. So we do a, a huge amount of work on reliability improvements components. This is looking at how we can improve the reliability around generators, converters, switch gears, subsea cables. Um, that's both uh, looking at Ch uh, changes in design, testing, and and um, and looking at uh, additional ways of, of of working on those things. There's also the development of advanced testing methods. So we do a huge amount of work. Um, we're looking at powertrain testing. Or we're currently testing uh, the Halide X system. Uh, we do a, a, a large number of cable tests per year, and not just looking at the dynamic cables I mentioned earlier, but looking at cable failure modes. How do we improve the, uh, the reliability of these cables, both subsea, um, buried in the seabed? Uh, development of more. That's with the, um, the grid and the grid network. And then we've got advanced health condition, condition monitoring tools. And again, you know, within the grid space, we're looking at a lot of power converters and cables, but this has been generally expended into, into the switch gear and into some of the generator components. So can we monitor the health? Can we uh, predict the, the um, remaining usable life of a component? Can we identify problems before they become problems? And that leads to reduced OM costs, hopefully improve reliability, hopefully longer life. And the final point is supporting next generation component development. So what does a next generation component turbine, but or costs or lower burdens on rarer? I mentioned briefly on the grid integration challenge. Um, I think this is a, a, a great diagram explaining one of the challenges you've got. So in the UK at the moment, we're, we're at, I think at nine gigawatts of offshore wind, uh, properties are heated by natural gas. 50-ish percent of our electricity generation is still from fossil fuels. And most people's cars are running on, on, um, on fossil fuels. So if we're looking at our ambition for 2030 of 40, 30 or 40 gigawatts, that means a much greater proportion of our um, power generation is gonna be coming from renewables. So it's gonna be more intermittent. There's a, increased push away from combustion engines to hybrid or electric based vehicles, potentially hydrogen powered vehicles. And then if we start thinking bigger picture and moving further away, what's it going to look like in 2050 and 2060? So a lot of the work we're doing at the moment is how are we going to be able to predict what bigger deployments will do? How will it impact on the primary energy consumption? Can we forecast what that will be? 
How are we going to overcome things like the intermittency of renewables? You know, what are we going to do around the fact that a wind turbine will only turn when the wind blows? So this starts to lead into some of the really big um, challenges around energy storage and, and brings in the whole hydrogen piece alongside electrochemical and potentially other novel energy storage systems. And so we're really moving into that space right now of what can we do in order to future proof our systems, but future proof how offshore wind integrates into those. Uh, the next topic is robotics, data and AI. So I think one of the main challenges around robotics, data and AI for us is um, a real push from industry um, to reduce the amount of time spent offshore carrying out operation and maintenance, which are high risk in terms of safety and high cost. So uh, as a, at the Catapult, we're doing a huge amount of stake engagement and looking at what the industry pull around that is, uh, developing roadmaps and engaging with industry groups. And, see on this slide um, we've identified a, a, a series of potential areas where robotic applications could be used uh, and what use cases could be developed and here we're looking at not just uh, um, inspecting turbines but how do we upset inspect the substructures and the electrical infrastructures as well so look at the whole system um, I think it's sometimes good to explain some of the projects we've done in the past or give a highlight of some of the projects we've done in the past so um, some snapshots here, but we, we've we've worked with several um, technology developers to help prove out that technology, ranging from Bladebug, which is the the crawler that you can see, and, and the picture on the bottom left there is the Bladebug system on top of our eleven mouth seven megawatt turbine, through to uh, things like Rovco and their subsea um, systems, which are doing cable inspections and monitoring systems like that. And we work very closely to help validate that technology, provide spaces for demonstration um, and support use cases. Within the Catapult, we also have a very strong data and digital team. And here we're very much focused on digital transformation of the sector to optimize operational performance. Uh, so improve safety, improved environment, decreased cost. So this can be through the application of data analytics, looking at things like SCADA data um, and looking at um, data coming from next generation sensors in order to detect faults and start to predict faults. Um, it could be around uh, providing data uh, analysis tools to support decision making. Um, there's been some interesting projects here looking at how we can use wave data and, and weather data to identify windows for, for carrying out O&A operations. So it's a big area and this ties really nicely with robotics because if we can couple the two together so you can have a, a data system on a wind turbine identifying a fault and then couple that with a robotic inspection or repair process that gives us a, a good platform for moving forward and, and reducing human intervention wherever possible. Again, one of the final topics is the next generation materials and manufacturing. So this focuses on some of the capabilities we have in our blades team in particular. So the group here are really trying to combine things like materials and manufacturing development, uh, development of novel structures and new structures, and then the air elastics. Uh, so the simulation and um, aero performance and, and how, a, how a system may work. And, and those, these areas cover a, a, a breadth of things from how do we develop sensors how do we protect the leading edge of a, of a turbine blade, which is one of the main erosion areas um, and a critical element needs doing, through to how do we test and validate these systems? So we have a 100 meter blade test facility and a 50 meter blade test facility. So if we've got a new structural design, how do we validate that using those test capabilities? So in terms of our core facilities, um, it's quite a busy slide, just, but just gives you an idea of the, the breadth of things we've got going on. Um, so, you know, from resin infusion and materials characterization through to, there's a picture there of our 100 meter, uh, within our 100 meter blade test facility. Um, so we're looking at displacement tracker, we're looking at how much force is needed to, to exercise the blade, we've developed the blade testing. Um, we've got our rain, we've got a rain erosion test rig, um, the R&D AS RET system, which is used by a lot of the uh, OEMs, but through this we can um, validate a range of different materials pre-commercialization and support the development moving forward and then things like uv and weathering you know what actually happens to a system um when it's left you know what what's the impacts of any of any growth or anything like that that might happen 
Uh, and then moving forward, we're looking at next generation manufacturing in a lot more detail. So we're uh, uh, we're currently installing a 3D printer, a large 3D printing cell, which will be uh, pellet driven. Uh, and here we're looking at what can we do around blade manufacturing um, using advanced manufacturing techniques in order to reduce the waste, uh, reduce the capex around molds through to um, increasing the throughput of prototypes. Okay. So to, to finish off, um, and I, I, I'm not planning to, to go through these in, in any detail, I just wanted to flash up a, a, some of the breadth of calls that we're currently looking at within RE Catapult within Horizon Europe. Um, so in terms of the renewables calls coming up, you'll see that we cover ocean energy through to floating wind and new materials, um, and they're in cluster five and cluster four, um, which Helen went through quite nicely earlier. Um, some of them with very, very tight deadlines, some of them with, with a little bit more time to discuss. Um, but if, if yourselves or, or you know of any other businesses working in these spaces or interested in the discussion, we'd be more than happy to follow, follow through. In terms of energy systems, um, I apologize, there's a couple of gaps there. Um, there's a, a list of the energy systems calls that we're currently working on too. And you'll see we're looking a lot around reliability and power electronics and, and, and the integration within the system. Um, so looking at key component areas and, and how we can improve them and support them moving forward, which will be critical to, to, to driving the industry further. And then looking slightly further into the distance, um, the, the circular economy comes through, um, tidal, integrated wind farm control and, and, and robotics. So there's a real breadth of topics that we're very interested in. So. Um, uh, that's everything I'd like to say today. So thanks very much for your attention. Um, more than happy to answer some questions at the end. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's a really thorough overview of uh, Ori Catapult and some of the key research interests we have, which are linked to these major European funding calls coming forwards. Um, but obviously, uh, European funding is not just about research institutions. It's about how do we translate those ideas to real companies and um, you know make viable commercial products and services which can really impact on the renewable energy sector so we've brought uh, along uh, a couple of colleagues from uh, organizations who kindly given their time to talk about their kind of products and services and, and links into the European uh, market so uh, I think uh, first of all I'd like to introduce uh, Sabrina uh, Malpied who's the Executive Director of ActBlade who's going to give us a, an overview of uh, their organisation and um, some of the leading edge uh, work they're doing in uh, novel blade technology. So over to you Sabrina, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you James. First of all, thank you for uh, having me uh, um, here in this um, in this session. It's actually very informative so far as well for me that uh, I've been working with Ori Catapult for uh, many years now. So I'm Sabrina Malpede, uh, co-founder and managing director of a company based in Edinburgh called Act Blade Limited. Um, well, what Act Blade is doing is actually uh, our motto is uh, to develop the wind turbine blade. Uh, for a net zero uh, future. Uh, um, so our uh, view is not only uh, to bring an innovative blade design, uh, a blade concept to the market, but actually to respond to the urgent needs uh, uh, of uh, making blade more in a more sustainable manner. Um, the company is uh, five years old almost, and I, it, uh, uh, but the real uh, core of the project um, the work has been started um, actually just uh, three years ago. And um, we have been working, um, I have to say, uh, since, I, uh, since, uh, since the outset that uh, the first people that uh, have been, we have been sharing our idea uh, about the uh, uh, active blade were the uh, team of the official renewable energy catapult. So we are very grateful. Pro probably we are where we are just because of those conversations we had at a very early stage. Um, 
so, so the, I prepared a presentation, I hope it works. Um, so what is the, the problem we are trying to solve? I'm sure that the whole audience uh, uh, um, is well aware. It's uh, practically wind, the wind energy industry is uh, on a mission to reduce uh, its uh, production cost uh, in, ter in terms of a levelized cost of energy. So to, uh, to reduce not only the capital costs, uh, but also, also the operational costs and to increase uh, the energy production. Definitely the most, uh, uh, the easiest way to reduce that cost is by increasing the annual uh, energy production. And this uh, has been the main reason for uh, the exponential growth uh, of uh, the, uh, those turbines over the years. Uh, and, and those big turbines uh, obviously uh, need uh, as well very long blades. Uh, and uh, as uh, Thomas has uh, mentioned, uh, the, there are already blades longer than 100 meters. But uh, with, the, um, with the, the conventional way of making blades, um, the, those blades are actually becoming very, very heavy. Uh, very expensive to produce. This is a picture taken uh, from the internet. Is uh, the Siemens Gamesa facility in Hull, so um, where they produce a 75 meter long blade. So practically, the mold they use, the tooling they use, is as big as the blade, and that means not only uh, uh, very expensive uh, tooling, but as well a large footprint and um, and uh, a, a, and, this, <laughs> and polluting actually. Uh, Processes. Uh, then those uh, very long blades are difficult to transport and as we know are very difficult to recycle uh, because there are no uh, yet uh, very clear uh, circular processes for uh, fiberglass, um, uh, fiberglass blade. So um, the act blade, uh, this is actually a, a sketch of, um, of a, a, our concept. So the act blade um, is made of an internal uh, fishbone structure. This is the way we call it. So we have a spar. Uh, and then we are uh, we have some ribs, and uh, uh, and then we use the textile to cover the entire surface of the blade. Um, then we have actually a solid tips uh, tip uh, at the end because uh, obviously we need some space for uh, the lightning protection system. Uh, um, very important to say uh, to begin uh, to begin with that. So the the spar is uh, as you can see probably here is about 45 percent. Okay, can be between 40 to 45 percent of the uh, cord of a blade. So uh, this means that actually our tools uh, to produce the blades are uh, even smaller than uh, than a half of the is half of the size uh, of the conventional blade. And then it's component. Be, uh, uh, based. So a lot of the processes can be uh, run in parallel. And uh, the other uh, very important point uh, is uh, about uh, transportation, about uh, uh, manufacturing possibilities, because uh, all those elements can actually be built in different facilities and then assembled uh, in a facility uh, that can be uh, close to the place. So a lot of uh, 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 opportunities uh, um, from, um, uh, from this concept. In terms of, um, of where we are, um, uh, practically, we have uh, uh, developed uh, our first mini series of uh, five uh, blades. Uh, those blades are 13 meters long. We call it. Uh, we call them the Act 27 uh, because they they are actually 13 meter uh, blade long, built for uh, um, turbine the, the Vessels turbine the V27, which is a 225 kilowatt turbine. Um, so this has been uh, a very important step for us because uh, uh, given the novelty of uh, our of the technology and actually the very high barrier to enter the market. It was very important uh, for us to actually uh, create a complete proof of concept um, for uh, a, a, a actually demonstrated that the, the active blade uh, works. The video, which I think is a stop, uh, is showing the fatigue test we have carried out at the offshore renewable energy uh, catapult uh, uh, this spring. Uh, so the blade has survived all the static tests, uh, fatigue, uh, uh, 
fatigue, post fatigue, and uh, hopefully uh, mid of July we will uh, uh, we will set three of those blades on a real turbine for uh, for testing. Um, so in terms of IP, the, our, uh, we have actually a very strong IP position. Uh, we have two families of patent. The first uh, family, which is covering the whole manufacturing method has been granted already in UK, in China, in US, and in all over Europe. Uh, the second, um, uh, then we have a second uh, um, patent family that is covering actually um, uh, the ability, uh, uh, um, a system to uh, uh, change the shape of the, the blade, um, mostly created for the offshore um, application. And that has been uh, granted already in Europe and China. Uh, now, why uh, the act blade? So what, what, um, what are the benefits of the, the act blade? Uh, actually, why it is, it's important to the new challenges of the wind energy industry, which is offshore, floating offshore. Uh, but I honestly believe it, that I honestly believe that the, the uh, onshore um, market is still uh, massive. Um, so why the act the blade? Because of the way we uh, we manufacture the blade, the material we use, so we are actually uh, much lighter than a conventional blade. So considering a 50 meter long blade, our blade can be uh, between 15% to 32% lighter than a conventional blade. This means that we can use the, the weight uh, differential either to produce long, uh, longer blades, so we can actually do a 10% longer blade that is still lighter than uh, the, uh, the 50 meter long blade and, and therefore increase the energy production by 9% and directly reduce the cost of energy by, 9%, uh, by 7%. Then the other way, uh, the other area that I think is very, very important considering the, uh, the circularity, actually uh, the, 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 the importance of making blade production more sustainable in long term is the fact that the, our blade uh, uh, um, is promoting a linear, a linear manufacturing system. So first of all, all our tools are much smaller. So we require a much smaller factory, 47% uh, less area. And this is uh, easier to, to think about uh, because we do not need a painting shop, which is actually a, a very expensive shop in uh, blade manufacturing. Uh, then uh, the cost of the tooling is about 60% less and uh, we require, uh, the, the, practically we can produce blades quicker than uh, conventional, what we call a conventional blade. Uh, the other very important point that uh, our textile, for instance, uh, is uh, as a, is uh, fully recyclable, and we can also upcycle, so we can use at the end of life for uh, other application. Um, and we have already uh, experienced the use of uh, um, actually recycled uh, fibers for some of the elements of the of our blades, and we uh, we actually uh, are co constantly uh, thinking about about the use of uh, appropriate material uh, in our blade to make it uh, um, as, as more circular as possible. Um, in terms of uh, our story and uh, practically our story with uh, the offshore renewable energy catapult, uh, I already mentioned that uh, uh, we actually disclosed our idea to, to the team our catapult uh, in 2015, and we ran with them um, a feasibility study. So they really took us when we, our TRL was one. It was an idea in our mind. And then, um, uh, and then uh, since then, we have constantly been working uh, with the, the team, the innovation team, uh, and uh, also used the other, uh, other um, areas of the offshore renewable energy catapult. I think uh, um, uh, the ORI catapult has not only uh, been our partner in some of the Innovate UK um, projects, uh, but is also partner in one of the um, European European programs uh, we, are, uh, we are supported by, which is the EIT um, uh, Inno Energy. So it's from the Euro European Institute of Technology. So they, they, are, uh, uh, they are 
our partners. Uh, so areas uh, are, num first of all, is uh, definitely blade testing. Uh, so it's about, uh, so now the Oricata um, uh, team is able to actually test, uh, they do carry out the static and fatigue test of uh, um, textile blade, but we have been using, we will be uh, keeping using their uh, 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 rain erosion test rig. Uh, and uh, from time to time, uh, we are getting their support, uh, their technical support uh, in terms of uh, uh, blade uh, design, blade loads, uh, but as well as uh, material and, um, uh, and the testing uh, method of testing. So uh, they, there is actually uh, a large collaboration ongoing with uh, the offshore renewable energy catapult. Um, so this is us in a nutshell, uh, if uh, any question, uh, I'll be happy to answer. That's great, thanks Sabrina. That's a, a very good uh, very good piece of promotion for ORE catapult capabilities as well. But I think um, yeah, <laughs> it's great to see, um, you know, kind of a, a, a novel company like yourself growing so rapidly in developing some really cutting edge technology for, for offshore wind. So <clears throat> as I think uh, we've put in the chat box, we'll, we'll take any Q&A at the end. And I guess we'll, we'll try and make this uh, interactive for the attendees. So please do just fire in any questions and we'll deal with those after the final presentation. Uh, and the final uh, presentation for today is uh, Tom Morley, who's uh, the uh, business uh, development manager for Synaptic, who we've uh, worked closely with uh, looking at um, monitoring technologies on electrical uh, infrastructure. So uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to uh, show your slides. And... Thanks, James. Uh, can you see that? Okay. Yeah, sure we can. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Tom Morley from Synaptic and I look after business development for renewables and I'll talk briefly about our technology who we are, some of the applications, and also the work we've done with ORE Catapult. Uh, yeah, so Synaptic are a leading photonic sensor company based in Glasgow in the UK. And we've invented a unique way for measuring electrical current and voltage passively. So we have a distributed electrical sensor net network, and these are passive sensors and we connect to these sensors using the existing fiber optic found in array and export cables in the offshore sector. And our mission is to reduce capital and operational costs through better instrumentation. Um, and some of the projects we've worked on are across the bottom here. So in transmission, we've worked with Scottish Power, Statnet, SSE and Red Electrica, and then I'll be focusing more on our work on offshore. So that's we've done a project with Catapult on their leaving mouth test turbine. And that has led to another one with Catapult and Vattenfall on the Aberdeen Bay wind farm. We've also just started doing some work with the railways with Deutsche Bahn in Germany. Uh, so just briefly, I think it's pretty useful. I'll just go through how the technology works. We can fit up to 30 passive sensors per fiber at a range of 60 kilometers. So 60 kilometers allows us to have our systems mount interrogators in the offshore or onshore substation and then look at every wind turbine and cable across the array. And we can put any combination of voltage, current, temperature, vibration and strain sensors out across there. and. Um, the big saving comes from, compared to normal instrumentation, if you want to make a measurement of voltage or current, you then would need power, a data network at that measurement location, and then uh, possibly a time clock if you're looking for synchronization. Um, we use industry standard CTs and VTs, and um, there's no calibration required. It all self-calibrates. I'll just go through some of the applications now. First one is cable connection monitor. This has been developed in response to the number of cable faults, so electrical faults. Uh, this graph here shows electrical faults being one of the largest causes of cable failure. And this is from Catapult's data. Now, electrical faults are a significant failure mode. 
and to date there's no real monitoring of the cable terminations you have technologies such as dts which are really good for looking at the cable but they don't look at the cable terminations and ccm has been developed to monitor the termination so we monitor the sheaf current and the temperature of the termination as i said these are all passive sensors so in the transition piece of the turbine we put our sensors around the shifts for each phase and also a temperature sensor onto the cable termination and the interrogator is the only powered unit back in the substation and by looking at the sheaf current and cable termination and temperature we're looking for changes in the levels of current flowing in the sheaf and that could be down to changes in continuity or changes in resistance and then we can correlate this with hot spots in the terminations to give advance warning of changes at the termination which will lead to failures and the next one this picture is from Aberdeen Bay um, which is a catapult and Vattenfall project with ourselves and it's the power quality measurement so I think earlier in um, the presentation she talked about grid integration and things if you want to measure power quality across a wind farm currently it's quite very difficult because you've got all these multiple sources of generation and if you just measure at the substation all you get is the aggregate across that turbine so you could get harmonic being injected from any one of those turbines and like I say if you measure from the substation all you get is that combined aggregate or you may even get um, cancelling out as certain harmonics hide each other so um, you and then the alternative way is you use sort of just a one-off handheld unit and you go out and you measure it at one location but then the problem the challenge for the industry is how do you use that data if you need to monitor many places synchronously it's very it's quite a task to actually um, marry up all that data afterwards and because we're synchronously measuring the very nature of the technology is to synchronously measure so we can take synchronous power quality measurements from every location across a wind farm so that might be from the turbines then either side of the transformer on the offshore and onshore substation that means you know, there's no subtraction or addition and you can track where these problem harmonics arise and we can see the whole waveform which gives real insights um, this is a real world example of where this would be useful. This is public domain data from a wind farm in Denmark. And you can see at this location, the red lines show a scattering of 17th harmonic before there was any intervention. And then after active filtering, that problem was reduced. What's interesting is at the same time, at another place on the wind farm there was no problem with the harmonic and this just illustrates the need to be able to measure synchronously across the wind farm and now briefly um, just look at some of the work we're doing for floating wind as floating wind develops we're looking at different the industry is looking at different ways for array cables and this is just one example and we have a system for identifying which section has a fault immediately again because the technology is passive and small it can fit into cable splices giving you instantaneous information on a, which section has a fault in and then taking it up onto the platform obviously as you go into a dynamic platform you have um, the requirement for strain is also added so here we have strain or measurements across the platform and we're also looking at doing strain where the array cable um, joins the platform and that's coupled with current and voltage measurements all on the one system and then these are the projects we've done with catapult the first one back in 2019 was on the leaven mouth turbine and here we had current sensors at each end of the cable as well as temperature sensors on the cable terminations and there we were looking at power quality and also um, electrical protection for that cable 
And this is just some pictures taken from that project. So you can see the CTs here in this central picture. They just simply clamp round the cable and all that's going back to the onshore substation is this single mode optical fiber that's already in the cables. And you can just about make out on the right hand picture the temperature sensors on the cable terminations. And on the left, we have our interrogator, which sits in the protection rack in the substation. And this trial was really good in proving how the technology worked on a small scale. And then that led to this year, we have just finished installing with Vattenfall on their um, Aberdeen Bay wind farm, which um, that's been in coordination with Catapult. And here we're doing both of the export cables that run from the first turbine to the onshore substation. And we're doing differential current protection, live monitoring of the termination for temperature and also power quality. Um, so, yep, we're, here's our contact details. If people have any questions, happy to answer in the Q&A or otherwise just drop me an email. That's great. Thanks, Tom. That's a very informative overview of the technology and the, the benefits to the uh, to the offshore wind sector. So <clears throat> the only uh, questions in the Q&A box at the moment are, will the presentations be uh, available? Um, so yes, I think the, uh, the answer is to uh, make those available and circulate to everyone. Um, I think uh, just a couple of um, questions, I guess, from, from myself, that, that might be of interest to the European audience, to the um, to Actblade and Snaptech. Uh, in terms of, um, obviously, we're kind of talking about European funding and European engagement. So in terms of um, working with partners in Europe, is there something that uh, you guys are particularly looking for in terms of, um, you know, companies to work with or research capability in terms of particular strengths and um, what, what do you see as the particular innovation challenges for you um, over the next sort of two or three years that the, the Horizon program could help to fund or reduce the risk uh, for your organization? So um, I, I guess, uh, Sabrina, I'll, I'll give you the, the joy of going first, but uh, if you've got any thoughts on that. Thank you. So first of all, I was very happy to hear from Ellen that uh, uh, the UK uh, has applied to become an associated country. Uh, I have a question for Ellen. I don't, I didn't understand whether this has been ratified so companies can already apply or we should still wait for, uh, for that. So it's an open question to Ellen. Going back to ActBlade, uh, I mentioned that we are already supported by a European uh, grant, uh, which is uh, the DIT No Energy, but uh, we have already applied in June, uh, the, the 16th of June, for the EIC accelerator, which uh, was not mentioned by Ellen, and uh, which I think is uh, uh, re really important for at least companies like ActBlade, because uh, uh, to, uh, uh, we are a TRL. Uh, probably six or seven if the test on the turbine will go well. And uh, the, the, we are practically in the middle of the value of that because we, it's very important for us to actually uh, uh, have the right finance in place to go to market. Uh, we have a strategy in place, but it's at the moment that the, uh, the company has a still a, a technology risk that is not probably um, uh, uh, creating the appeal just to private investors. So the IC accelerator to me is, a, is the perfect uh, option to do that. So yeah, we, we did it. I don't know uh, how we did it, honestly, because uh, we, we, it's a, now a three steps uh, application. We passed the step one on the 21st of May. So we uh, and the application uh, system was not ready yet uh, on the 21st of May. Uh, we, um, the, last, uh, the, the last release was uh, made the day before the deadline, the 15th of June. Uh, so we, we actually submitted the application, we will know in probably in six weeks, uh, but uh, um, I think if uh, we are not successful, we will uh, reapply definitely in October. 
Great. And uh, I guess for you, Tom, do you see, um, you know, what do you see? Are you looking for European research partners or is there? Uh, no, these are actually, uh, in fact, the, the other point, uh, uh, and probably, I don't know, it's, uh, it's about the UK. Um, uh, I don't know how the UK will actually uh, be part of the system, but I, I applied as a single company. So they were uh, uh, they were uh, supporting partners, but it was not uh, like a collaborative project, uh, and it was just uh, for, uh, covering practically the TRL seven eight, so the first of a kind of, uh, uh, commercial trial with a, a real uh, early adopter, uh, which we have now, um, and then following that, uh, the, um, some investment for the TRL nine. Uh, so setting up the manufacturing uh, um, and uh, going to market, hopefully. Okay. And Synaptec, um, I don't know if you, uh, Tom, if you've got any thoughts on what you're looking for from European partners or particular, you know, if they're coming forward with interest. Yeah, it, we're really keen to continue work with partners and we're looking really to go to scale with some of our tests. Um, there's a lot like I've talked about applications today which are we're selling today as products but there's a whole lot of work we're doing that's really interesting about preventing cable failures and we've done a whole a lot of work about measuring power quality and sheaf and harmonics and we would like to do some further tests but that involves finding a test site with you know, three or four turbines which is much harder to get that um, ability to invest to have a trial on that scale, but we think there's a lot of really interesting things that are still to come out. Um, so we're looking for partners to maybe scale up some of the trials. Sure, that makes sense. And Donna Helen, if you want to come in on any of that. Yes, yeah, just so to follow on from what Sabrina was saying about the um, accelerator. So yeah, this falls in within pillar three. So, um, and as she says, it's not a requirement to have collaboration for some of these um, calls. So it's certainly worth having a look at, um, specifically um, for that higher technology readiness level activity normally, um, addressing that valley of death. So it's certainly worth looking at the European Innovation Council, if that's the area that you're, uh, where, where you're at with your technology. Um, and just coming back to the point about UK association. So yeah, the UK hasn't formally associated. No, none of the associated countries have formally associated yet um, because they, they can't, that has to happen once a commission process is, is completed, but that's not because um, the UK doesn't want to. We are ready to associate. And as soon as, it, as, soon as it's possible to do so, we will do that. Um, and UK organizations in the meantime are eligible. We um then count towards those eligibility criteria so yes we can go for these first calls the only um criteria is that the association needs to have happened by the time a grant agreement is actually signed so it's not by the actual deadline it's by the time if you're successful you actually get to the grant agreement signature so it's some way in the future so that's that's very likely to have happened we don't anticipate any issues there so please go ahead and if you're a UK organization go ahead with preparing proposals and if you're a, an organization elsewhere in Europe or beyond and you're looking for partners please consider the UK uh, seriously if you, when you're looking for those partners okay. um yeah back to you James uh, yeah I mean just to wrap up I guess Tom Wildsmith uh, is there anything else you want to kind of mention in terms of the um, the RCO overview and uh, how to engage in some of the some of the technology areas you mentioned yeah I think it's just to reiterate you know um, from an RCO perspective if you want to get in touch with, with myself or James um, on any of the topics that we briefly discussed um, we, we're connected in with a, a, a range of SMEs not just one well equally wonderful to Tom and Sabrina, but not quite as brilliant as these two. Um, so we're more than happy to try and, you know, provide introductions to industry partners as well. Um, we're, we're really keen to re-engage with Europe. Um, uh, we've, we've, we have stayed engaged throughout, but we recognise that Brexit has thrown some uh, unexpected challenges over the last couple of years. And, and, and as we move out of that, we really want to establish some, some good uh, long-term 
uh, research and innovation relationships and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Tom. So I, th I think we'll probably wrap up there. We've, we've obviously got a very studious audience who've uh, been, been reviewing us. So um, I guess if you just want to talk about the next steps. Uh, um, yeah, that's right. I've just got a couple of slides to cover next steps. So as, as, um, as James says, the slides and the recording will be shared. Please do pass these on to others. I'll be doing that as National Contact Point here in the UK. We see these showcase meetings as a, a sort of extension of some of the brokerage events that some of you might have participated in. So where organisations only get a couple of minutes to showcase themselves. So here we're giving people more time to explain their capability. And we'd really like you to share that information around Europe and beyond to um, spread the message about UK eligibility, but particularly about the companies and organisations you've heard from today. Um, please do contact the presenters directly. You don't hesitate to do that, to talk to them about collaboration. Contact your national contact point. So that might be um, in the UK or beyond. So you'll have the links to that once, uh, once you get the slides. There's lots happening on Horizon Europe at the moment. It's a very busy time. The work programmes for cluster four and five are, are, are available. The, link, the links are on the slide there. There were the research and innovation days last week, which there are multiple mentions of Horizon Europe. So you can go back and listen to those. There are information days taking place. So even today, the cluster four information day is taking place. There'll be recordings available. Cluster five is Monday and Tuesday next week. So this is when the commission will present the core topics in detail. Really recommend you going along to listen to that, even if it's only the part that's relevant to you. The agenda is published and so you can join for the relevant sections and you don't have to register for those, you can just join online. There are also consortia building events. So we had one in the UK for cluster four and five earlier this month, and you can go and listen back to the recording of those. That's where organizations were pitching um, for participation in Horizon Europe. There are commission brokerage events coming up. So um, the cluster four one is tomorrow. You do need to um, register. You would have had to have register already to participate in this, but you can still view it um, if you want to hear the pictures that others are making. And it's still possible to register for the cluster five one, which is climate, energy and mobility, which takes place next Wednesday. So again, you'll have the link to that. And there will be more of those type of events in the coming weeks and months as we go towards the first deadlines for um, 2021 calls for proposals. There's also a couple of links there to webinars that have taken place on how to um, prepare a successful proposal. So I'll leave you with the contact details for the Energy National Contact Point here in the UK, which is me. Um, these contact details, please do contact me if you're interested in follow up to this showcase. From tomorrow, in fact, the UK National Contact Point service is going to transfer to Innovate UK. So we'll have a new email address. Um, but both will still work, you know, the EU Energy Focus one will still work, so you can contact, contact me via that. And if it's relevant to go through to the Innovate UK um, system, I'll, I'll pass that on. If it's specifically on the showcase and any follow-up, I can, I can help you with that. Um, but yes, that new email address will be live from tomorrow, so you'll be able to contact the UK National Contact Point for Energy through that, through that email address. So thanks very much for, for joining. And um, yeah, please, I look forward to, I hope you'll consider the UK as a, uh, a partner in your proposals. Thanks, Helen, and thanks everyone for joining. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for your time. Thanks.